Hello, we are here today with Amina and Kaziri Eid and Joyce Mangari for the new episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. We had an earlier episode with Joyce Mangari and Gugi a couple of weeks ago, where we talked about her career and also her input in, in all kinds of work with African scholarship and um, and now we are, we mentioned in the podcast that we're going to talk about her work with the, with the deaf community, which we didn't have time to, to cover in the previous podcast, but now we here, as mentioned, also joined by Amina and Kaziri Eid, who will help us translate with sign language, Kenyan sign language, to the Kenyan, but also international deaf community. And yeah, thank you very much for joining. And thanks, thanks for both of you, Amina and Wangari. You won't hear Amina, but you can um, see her in in the recording to this podcast that we're gonna put on on YouTube. So welcome, Wangari. And thank you uh, for inviting me once again. Sure, it's a pleasure. So maybe starting off with with terminologies around deaf, around people in the deaf community. Um, there's terms like hearing impaired or hearing loss um, that occur to people who don't hear so well or at all. What do community members prefer to be called themselves and refer to? And what are the terminologies that exist besides these two and three terms that I mentioned? Yeah, definition and meaning are very critical in the field of deafness. And if you look up a simple Google search on deaf definition, a lot of them will come up. But I would, I would say that the meaning of deaf in English is uh, inability to hear. So those who are unable to hear either completely or partly. Some people have been tot totally deaf since birth, some partially, some become deaf, and so therefore you have a host of different words like late deaf and oral deaf, and so on and so forth. We also have the word hard of hearing, uh, which refers to a hearing loss that's actually not so severe. It's partial inability. It could be one ear that's unable to hear or both uh, to only some limited um, hearing ability. Therefore, many people who are deaf communicate using sign language. Now, there are some words that are not preferred by the deaf community, such as hearing impaired. Impaired implies a lack or a loss you know, and uh, the connotation has also been connected to this thing of un being unwilling to hear or pay attention. That's the reason why uh, mm -hmm. a lot of these other words are actually uh, not ideal. Another word that has been used a lot is hearing disability. Mm -hmm. um, the deaf community happen to have two identities or so or more. <laughs> you could say that they consider themselves as people with disability, but on the other hand, they are culturally deaf. In other words, they see their deafness as a sense of pride. It's just one diversity, you know, in their identity. So we keep othering people and uh, when we talk in social sciences about othering, we're talking about this distinction of saying us versus them, mm -hmm. but they don't see themselves as really having a disability per se. The disability is in the environment around them. Now, it gets interesting when you translate the word deaf to Kiswahili and other African languages. Kiziwi is the most official word, but it has a diminutive prefix, key, and key is used to refer to objects and things. And therefore, Kiziwi has now been rejected by the deaf community in Kenya. And another very popular word that people like to use on the streets is bubu. Bubu is also not a very uh, acceptable word. Of course, we know in between um, conversation and within the deaf community, there are insider jokes whereby a deaf person can call the other person boo boo, which is a very peculiar phenomenon about, you know, being friendly. And if you know me well enough to 
to pass a bad joke, <laughs> but otherwise the official word that is preferred is deaf and deaf is a positive word. And uh, the WHO mentions that hearing loss of 20 decibels or better in both ears, people who have you know, uh, less than 20 decibels are people who are not able to hear, they don't have normal hearing and therefore they exist in, in a variety, as I said, of types as well as you know uh, hearing levels and therefore we call it deafness status so you can either be deaf or hard of hearing i think this is important to also highlight because deaf culture is now recognized under article 30 of paragraph 4 of the united nations convention on the rights of people with disabilities the mm -hmm. very famous crpd document and in that document um you know deaf culture is uh is actually celebrated and we need to do more of that. Uh, the UNCRPD recognizes deaf people as fully capable of making informed and powerful choices as citizens. And therefore there should not be any other way to look at them except uh, from a, a, a rights-based model uh, instead of a charity model or a, or a medical model. Thank you. Uh, thanks for explaining this. It's also that I've I've come uh, I've become aware of the term disability that that's like a negative connotation because it con contains the um, what's the word like this uh, meaning there's a yeah something is missing or lacking as you also explained now with the word impaired which I wasn't so aware of so thanks for um, for highlighting this to to us. Um, no. Yeah, you're uh, right. Some people will prefer to say differently abled instead of yeah. uh, disabled or disability. But again, disability, I would say, is more widely accepted because the deaf in Kenya will consider themselves as PWDs, people with disabilities. And we say people, not persons. So it's really mm -hmm. interesting the, the, the nuances and the connotations of each of these definitions and where they are applicable, especially on a more pragmatic level. For instance, for the deaf, once they register as people with disabilities in Kenya, they do get benefits as people with disabilities. But at the core, they still believe they're culturally deaf more than anything else. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, language is powerful indeed, and it's it's important to reflect on it every now and then, and to of course consult the people who are concerned what they prefer. Um, how did you get involved in working with deaf people and persons, or with people as a group? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so growing up, mm -hmm, my elder sister and she gave me permission to share this <laughs> i have two elder sisters one of them had a problem with one ear and so constantly my mom and my dad had to be take turns to um stay with her she was admitted in hospital for a long period of time and i began to reflect upon how our family really had to shift around because one of us was sick and I became really curious. My sister would tell me things like, you have two ears, I can't hear very well. I, I don't want to keep repeating. She would get upset if we were playing and I told her to say something again, you know, she said, you can hear properly, I can't, you know. And up to today, she still goes uh, for treatment for her one ear. So it is possible for somebody to have an ear problem and not a hearing problem. And sometimes both can occur. occur. Currently, she doesn't have a hearing problem. Uh, it was uh, fixed, but the, but the ear problem still is there in the anatomy of her ear. Uh, her eardrum has a little hole. So then I became curious and I began to research on famous deaf people online. I got into many deaf communities. Uh, that is, I'm currently a board member of a school, of a high school. Uh, of about 60 uh, high schoolers who are deaf and hard of hearing. I also am quite involved now in the community and um, I'm a trained and certified sign language interpreter as well as a consultant on deaf mental health. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it never ends because, you know, it's a small community and you always get invitations to uh, different events and um, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm also uh, very curious in qualitative research um, 
when I am thinking about positionality, I have to keep thinking about who I am, you know, my identity inside of the deaf community, constantly reviewing and remaining with a humble uh, mindset because you never stop learning anyway. Mm. There's um, a lot more opportunities now than ever before in this side of the world. We know that disability infrastructure uh, is better in more developed countries and um, in those countries um, that I like to call the majority world, <laughs> we still have a lot of uh, problems with uh, inclusion and I'm quite um, curious to advocate and be an activist for disability rights as well as deaf rights. Thank you. And do you also work as USIU, United States International University? And you started a working group there, isn't it? Yes, so actually, thank you for mentioning that. I'm very excited that uh, the fruits of our team have now born, uh, come to pass. <laughs> and uh, I was part of the task force of the people with disabilities and other special needs. So we came up with a policy to have USIU inclusive of people who have different disabilities and out of the task force and now we have just gotten a new hiring uh, they're now sending out job applications for people who would like to join the office of disability inclusion including sign language interpreters i was also the co-founder of the sign language club um, the only club in usiu at the time i hope it's still not the only one now that actually is all about the rights of people who are deaf and it's about sign language and deaf culture training. So I'm really, really honored to have worked under Dr. Josefina Rasa, who was the chair of the committee, the task force. And we came up with this policy, which other universities are now very curious to learn from us mm. and to, um, to actually in, uh, apply it because it's quite comprehensive, detailing all the different infrastructure and personnel and different resources that we need at the university. Yeah, that's really exciting to hear. Is the policy online? Can it, is it accessible? Online? Oh, actually, actually, currently it's private. Uh, it took quite a lot of manpower to put it together. Um, I could speak to the chair about whether in future it will be, but we were under very strict instructions. I mean, it was a closed group. So um, at least the university has adopted it, which is the most important thing. And now we have, we'll begin to see uh, true inclusion. Uh, for the first time ever, now we can admit students who are deaf and different disabilities. And uh, we've only had a few disabilities at USIU in the past, like people using wheelchairs and different others, but we haven't had full inclusion, but now it's becoming a reality. So it's really exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I'm asking this because we can put reference materials on the show notes and you will like to the listeners, you will find certainly find something that's um, mm -hmm. regarding sign language and yep. uh, other resources that USIU is right. providing. And maybe also um, beyond that, what, what best, best practices have you um, from the top of your head? What, how should universities and research institutions equip themselves to accommodate um, the deaf community as staff members, as active researchers, what's, what additional features would be necessary to imply at the work? Yes. Uh -huh. So first of all, we have to understand that the biggest barrier is attitudinal. Uh, therefore, inclusion has got to be explained in a way that provides advantages. Um, many times, even if we have the infrastructure and people with disabilities will join educational institutions, they still face a lot of attitudinal barriers. So first and foremost, trainings on disability inclusion, deaf culture and sign language would be the first step. Then secondly, hiring of personnel who interpret sign language in specialized fields. As you know, in higher education, we have technical words for different fields. And so you would want an interpreter who's tuned in and quite engaged in, for instance, 
a very specialized subject like psychology so that they they can assist the deaf and hard of hearing students to efficiently learn and to communicate. And so we know that uh, the three major barriers infrastructurally uh, for the deaf and hard of hearing are communication, information, and language. So we want to increase communication through normalizing so that those who feel less able to sign can still be friendly to the deaf and not socially isolate them. And then for information, we want to increase visual formats. So in many places, for instance, at clinics, uh, bus stops, we use a lot of audio uh, notifications. So you'll find at a doctor's clinic, there's an overhead speaker announcing who's going next, even at banks. But then now you find in banks, you'll have sticker numbers that's also visual that increases, you know, the interaction and information formats so that those people who are visual learners and visual uh, communicators can actually see. And then of course, for language, training on sign language is not to mean that everybody must be fluent in sign, no, but obviously we want to increase access to certain academic and um, extracurricular opportunities that can involve more deaf and hearing people. Uh, so those are some strategies for an inclusive space and those adapted technologies should go into also transliteration. For instance, if you have a document, you've got to think about which formats would really, really work for people who are more visual you know, than auditory. So a, a, a webinar like this would have um, a caption and also sub, uh, you know, really um, well created English subtitles, um, you know, so that uh, people can all feel accommodated and included. Yeah, so the, the necessary steps are really not so difficult to implement if you think about it. And it's quite tangible actually to put captions is nowadays also almost by default for many organizations and institutions to have in their webinars and maybe to also employ or recruit a sign language interpreter like we have here with Amina Kaziri. Um, thanks thankfully also again thanks for joining yes, us. Yes and, and and I'm glad she's here live nowadays there's also live remote captioning she doesn't have to be here she can be in another part of the world like mm -hmm. we all are from different parts of the world right now exactly. <laughs> then other other simple accommodations are like preferential seating you know and then very importantly recruitment and mobilization so you might create all the infrastructure and the training and the policy but then you have no student who's able to join because maybe the cutoff score to get into university is so high and we know that a lot of people who are deaf and hard of hearing have had a lot of challenges going to higher education because of low grades and this is not because they are less intelligent no. it's because of inferior education they have not been able to access a good quality education a lot of their teachers are not well trained in sign language so therefore their learning was already affected from earlier years so modifications in the admission process to help students who are deaf to access uh, learning so that they can come in and then when they are there um, ongoing conversations on how best to accommodate them, um, you know, in, in the classroom, they, they will mostly prefer to sit at the front because of, you know, just the visual distractions mm -hmm. uh, to avoid all the distractions, um, you know, between them and the, and the lessons. So things like those, and those are ongoing adjustments come in if you have a leader who can actually advocate for really, um, good attitudes and true sanctions and true, should I say punishments for those who actually are discriminatory or oppressive or abusive to people who are differently able, those things need to be implemented um, inside of a framework. You know, what do you do then when you find somebody who's, uh, you know, maybe insulting a student who's different? Uh, the, that should not be left to pass that act of discrimination should be dealt with decisively yeah um also to obviously to protect the community and the individuals um we know that for humans as humans it's important to have role models 
Can you mention maybe two or three researchers or educators that have succeeded despite their presumable disability, which might not necessarily have to be one if there's an enabling environment at place yes. that yes. we can also mention? Of course, we know famous deaf people worldwide. Ludwig van Beethoven is a Ooh. common one. He composed beautiful music and as he became deaf increasingly deaf it did not affect his musical composition many people don't actually realize deaf people are also very musical <laughs> there's nothing that takes out musicality from somebody who's deaf then of course you have helen keller who was both deaf and blind she's really inspired a lot of deaf people to also work with deaf blind people because deaf people also um you know some of them happen to have the gift to do tactile communication with the deaf blind. So Helen Keller, global figure, uh, very well known. There are others who are less well known, Mali, Maclean, a famous American actor. Now coming home, I, I could talk of Professor Ndurumo. Professor Michael Ndurumo was actually inspired by the father of deaf education in Kenya, who um, unfortunately um, died in a plane crash and uh, that was Dr. Andrew Foster. He's an African-American man who was going to meet um, Professor Mike Ndurumo for another meeting of, you know, just installing sign language and deaf culture in Kenya, professional, you know, systems and all. And so Dr. Andrew Foster has done some am amazing work of, you know, getting um, institutionalizing uh, the deaf in various industry, education, healthcare, different things like that. So, and then Professor Mike Ndurumo, there are many others I could mention, but I think let me stop at those five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say the deaf community are an inspiration. Every day they wake up and they are quite uh, resilient despite many barriers in the environment and in society. They are also quite inspiring. Mm. Um, please tell us about your everyday work also at Ada Africa and we've done some some work together also um, thinking about diversity within the program that we mentioned also in the previous episode um, yeah. which is now being built towards open peer reviewers in Africa mm -hmm. where we also had Amina present for um, live interpretation in sign language as well as accommodating Arabic and French besides English for the workshops, but how, like, is, is it difficult to implement and include um, interpretation in sign language into programs, or is it just a matter of getting the team aligned and then let's go for it, let's do it? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would say it's a good challenge, what you would call a good problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I work, I founded a an organization called Guira Communications Foundation, which is my legacy project. And I'm, I'm now able to implement a lot of the work I did in my doctoral dissertation. So my doctoral dissertation was on deaf adults' mental health. And I was looking at their psychosocial support concerns at home, at work, socially, you know, also their personal private leisure, as well as family and relationships, and how that is uh, correlated with depression. And we found that actually there is a correlation between mental health concerns and access or in access. And so at Guira, Guira is a Rwandese word, which means kindness. We are spreading kindness all over the world, and we would like to end the stigma, the shame, um of this uh disability unfortunately many people consider deafness a low incidence disability there are not so many people who are deaf in any population and therefore because of that they think it is not important and so that presents the biggest challenge when um we would like true inclusion so many organizations individuals entities will say will give lip service to inclusion, disability inclusion, but when it actually comes to allocating um, funding and really centering the issues of people who are differently abled, at the end of the day, it becomes a tag, you know, a push and pull tag of war. And uh, with the resource limitations, I must say, 
we've also not prioritized enough. Um, usually, those of us who work in the disability community know that if you include people with disabilities, then everybody is happy. For instance, in a building, if you decide you're going to put a ramp, guess what? Those people who use wheelchairs plus people who don't use wheelchairs, all of them will benefit from the ramp, you know? And mm -hmm. if one day you need to use a trolley or some other bag or something, you can use the ramp. So including <laughs> people with disabilities is not an inconvenience. It's actually uh, a very vital component of development. But uh, to foster such disability inclusive relationships is not easy. Mm. It comes with quite a number of challenges about people not being supportive, positive or confident about what is possible. And also continuously implementing these programs becomes a challenge because those organizations or institutions who decide to do that will do it on a one off basis and therefore it's not sustainable. Mm. And we've not yet found um, uh, while there's been a lot of affirmative action, we've not yet found you know, strategies or uh, self-advocacy measures by the deaf people themselves that would have them included continuously over and over and over again. So the integration and mainstreaming aspects are complex, you know. If you look at the media currently, the portrayal of the deaf are either superheroes or objects of pity. So currently we are not yet there. We still seem to uh, use the charity model a lot when we think about, oh, we need humanitarian support for these people, rather than thinking of them as full citizens with full rights, you know, to access different types of services across the board, um, whether it's government services, healthcare, education, and so on and so forth. So the, the most typical challenges are attitudinal, you know, infrastructural, and even just literacy on, you know, what it would mean if your organization has a disability friendly policy. For instance, in Kenya, 5% of any organization needs to have people with disabilities as employees. So for instance, if you have a hundred employees at your organization, at least five of them need to be differently abled, but it's not clearly, um, delineated is not clearly explained exactly how we will go about ensuring this and how to measure it and how to you know mitigate um against the most typical challenges i've been in several situations where people with disabilities have literally been chased away there was a lady friend of mine i was helping to get a, ho a hotel job she mm -hmm. wanted to um work as a waitress to serve you know, food and beverages to customers. And, and the boss in the hotel just literally chased us away. He said, no, 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 you cannot work here. You're deaf, you know? So this is very typical, the scenario when deaf people say, here we are, we would like to be included. And therefore, how then can we foster deaf inclusive participation that's meaningful over and over again, you know, we need more constructive partnerships uh, with strategic stakeholders. The government cannot always pass the buck to well wishers as it is currently doing. That does not work. Mm. We need government to have impactful action, set up a registry of sign language interpreters and deploy them in every of our 47 counties in Kenya. And then we need to ensure ownership and buy in of the initiatives. Uh, by the people with disabilities themselves. There's been a lot of apathy too and land helplessness because when we have a vision, we may not include them fully in every stage. And therefore, when they are left out, they don't just show up at all. And so we need um, quite a comprehensive strategy for to ensure success and sustainability of disability inclusion. Yeah, I like the way how you um, phrase or how you explain that looking at accommodating uh, inclusiveness for deaf individuals should not be seen as a burden, but as an opportunity to be also be more inclusive of anyone really wanting to participate. Because, and we see that, as mentioned um, earlier in this episode, um, with with live captions to a webinar or sign language interpreter we we basically have the opportunity to watch the recording as much without without sound 
and still get the so for example follow a presentation and still be able to read what the presenters say at the same time and that's beneficial for anyone as well as deaf people isn't it mm -hmm. and yes. there's, there's many other examples that we could pull out also with the example of the waitress um even if that be uh i was gonna say hearing impaired because i thought it was a a good uh term and now learning it's not so deaf waiters and waitresses i mean why not because there's many devices that can give um visual signals if if some somebody um has a an order to place and you don't really see it um, because you're you know if somebody's calling on you and you can't hear it there's other ways to call for attention um how do you see artificial intelligence tools coming up on the market, like like the mentioned um, algorithms and and programs for live captioning? Is this helpful or beneficial? And would that be a threat to um, live interpreters that are real humans, real mm -hmm. persons like Amina, or can it be used complementary? in a way that's beneficial for anyone and doesn't um, threaten the job market for life interpreters? I think it is all welcome. Um, AI technology helps students who are deaf to learn. Uh, where interpreters cannot reach, AI, uh, uh, such as the YouTube closed captioning, will auto-generate the words, and so deaf people can follow. And even when a sign language interpreter is present, you find that it augments uh, what the live interpreter is doing, you know, and they're able to follow written text as well as uh, the expressions on the face of the interpreter. So I don't see this as a question of either or. Mm -hmm. I would say that now with technology, we are enjoying a lot of lot, lots of benefits such as um, transliteration. You can also have text. Uh, that are transliterated from um, standard English to more signed uh, versions that are easier to actually follow and read. Then we also have, aside from um, AI technology and sign language interpreters, we have deaf interpreters, fellow deaf people who can take the non-standardized signs, what we call home signs, uh, that are invented at home and deaf fellow deaf people can interpret to a standard sign language interpreter. For instance, Amina, who works as in the court of law, has had experiences where you know you have a deaf person who cannot speak standard sign language, so you get an, a fellow deaf person to stand next to them and interpret the home signs into standard sign language, and therefore then she'll pick up the standard sign language and voice it in English. So. Uh, technology, I mean, one of the things you've got to remember is also that the deaf and hard of hearing are early adopters of technology. And I wrote a, a journal article just on, on social media use by the deaf in Nairobi mm -hmm. to do business. Yes, so I'm going to share that. Uh, it was published under University of Nairobi um, journal. Brilliant. And how about, um, do you have deaf individuals in the Ada Africa community and how is the collaboration there what's what's a typical in engagement interaction scenario between the deaf and the non-deaf individuals of the community yeah thank you so much for the question yes we do have uh, a couple few scholars uh, Ada Africa runs a program called the journal club which is a volunteer space for any scholar who would like to join. So far, I think I've seen only three out of about a thousand. That tells you that a lot more needs to be done. And uh, by fostering more close collaborations with universities, we can spread the gospel of research mentorship. For the deaf who have enlisted in our program, they have found great use and benefit in uh, joining our live, we've had live meetings, group meetings, as well as uh, uh, online group meetings where we do webinars or mentorship or trainings. And uh, we try as much as possible whenever somebody signs up for a particular program that we can accommodate them fully. Um, my work with the deaf goes as far back as um, 
2006 thereabouts. So it's been a great uh, 16 years. But the highlight was actually in 2018 when I got a global award for my work in deaf mental health. I had deaf people throughout my research um, um, as participants and also as research assistants. Mm -hmm. They also assisted to analyze the data and recommended that I do a confirmatory FGD, a focus group discussion to just confirm the findings from the individual interviews, which was a really great recommendation. It really brought out uh, rich information from my research on deaf mental health. So I would say that it still feels like um, it takes one person to do a lot of the effort in a more solitary way. It feels like you know, but without the one person who leads the change, then there is no change. So luckily, Ada Africa Journal Club is a really dynamic space and there's no bureaucracy. Um, a lot is welcome. We need a lot more volunteers. It's very expensive to actually um, hire a sign language interpreter like myself, who is trained or like Amina. Um, and that's one of the challenges, that's one of the barriers currently we are facing. Uh, our financial model is based on um, well wishers, we have a crowdfunding page, and so we'll be appealing to a lot more scholars who would like to enter the new frontier of research mentorship that's targeted for people with disabilities. We are yet to do that, targeting work, we've had just a, a nice welcoming space, but we, we are yet to really go uh into the nuts and bolts yeah so that's that's also important to mention i guess to budget appropriately for the facilitations necessary and to budget for like an occasional or consistent uh, salary for sign language interpreter is essential if you want to be an inclusive organization or program and i'm very happy to hear that Ada africa is is doing that and um, considering and also facilitating opportunities for inclusion as much and thanks to to your expertise and being able to inform the organization as a whole to be inclusive and become more and more so so i've i've learned a lot in this episode again from you after our conversations about mental health and academia in general and it's also um heartening as much as also uplifting to hear um, the mental health and challenges that are present for the deaf community um, and uplifting in the sense that there's so much and so, so many easy steps we can take to ease that, to come together as human beings that we are also in a research community. Is there anything else you would like to mention before we end this episode and hopefully also meet again in a future episode again? I'd like to say autism is a discrimination of prejudice against individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. We need a lot more training on autism and we need to increase access and access needs to be available. The users need to be aware. It needs to be accessible, um, affordable and good quality. We are yet to get there, but it is one step at a time. It is doable. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks very much, Wangari. And thank you again, also, Amina, for joining us today. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hear and see and read more of, of your work and also um, trying my best to implement um, and facilitating the deaf community also in the work that we do with Access to Perspectives and Africa Archive. Asante sana, asante ni sana. All right, thank you. Okay.